Hello and welcome back to Understanding Economics. In today's session, we're very pleased to have a special guest, Dr. Polly Cleveland, who teaches environmental economics at Columbia University. And she's going to be talking with us about economic reform and sustainability issues. So Polly, thanks very much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, an economist who we've both read extensively, I'm sure, Mason Gaffney, once wrote that at the density level of a nice, comfortable suburb, the entire population of the United States could fit in an area the size of South Carolina, which indicates to us that there is a tremendous amount of sprawl in the way our country is organized and the way our economy works. Um, you've written about some of the environmental and ecological impacts of this incredible sprawl. Talk about that a little bit and what kind of reforms can we look at to start to contain and reverse those problems? Well, sprawl means highly scattered development with, with vacant lots in between or lower density in between, especially when you get out to the west in California, uh, you will see uh, sort of parcels of developed houses interspersed among farm fields. And of course, that kind of an arrangement is very inefficient for both agriculture and for farming. Uh, another generator of sprawl, of course, is that the people who own the vacant or underdeveloped lots in the middle have very little incentive to develop them uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, depending on the area, there is a property tax penalty on the buildings if they develop. And if they are, another reason may be just that they are too wealthy to bother. And that is a major, major reason for withholding of land and other natural resources. Uh, let me give an example. In my neighborhood on the west side of Manhattan, the address of 15 Central Park West, which now has a very elegant, expensive, condo building on it, beautiful limestone building. For at least 50 years, that lot was vacant. And it was vacant be because, and that this was a lot that ran all the way through from, uh, from Central Park West to Broadway. Actually, there was a hotel on part of it, but it was a big lot and it belonged, as it turned out, to uh, a Greek shipping family. Yeah. And, you know, for years and years, I think some people tried to buy it from them. They weren't interested. The property taxes were minimal. And so that eyesore of a vacant lot just sat there, sat there, sat there, sat there. And, you know, 15 or between 10 and 15 years ago, somebody managed to pry that from them. But this is a lot of vacant lots that you will see, especially downtown vacant lots in Manhattan belong to trusts and estates or other forms of, of absentees. And the, the primary barrier, again, is that a lot of vacant lots or underdeveloped lots are held by usually wealthy absentees who can't be bothered. And what needs to be done to them, and this is why we've been talking about land value taxation here, what needs to be done at the very least is to shift the burden of the property taxes onto the land and off of the buildings. The, the very fact that, that the underdeveloped lots will be now paying a much larger share of the property taxes, well, it might be enough to uh, kick those Greek absentees into saying, hey, wait a moment, this is a cash flow drain and we should do something about it. So in any case, shifting to land value taxation is an, a very important way to uh, to restrict sprawl. Another thing is, again, uh, municipalities, well, there's an awful lot of corruption out there, and a municipality will subsidize a developer friend or maybe, or maybe the brother of one of the city councilors uh, who buys a cheap lot out in the boonies and then gets the city to run the utilities out to it. So that is, a, that is an, a, another cause of sprawl is basically corruption. It, it's interesting you mention um, that so much vacant land is held by trust and by wealthy people because you underscore one of the things that we've been exploring in this course and that is the character of land as an investment. 
And we've, all, we've noted, in fact, that land, if someone is looking for a long-term investment, land is ideal. And therefore, the owner, ownership of vacant land, as you point out, tends to be among the higher echelon of investors, which makes it even harder, I guess, to pry it away from them. Yeah, it's, and, and the thing is, the, the interesting thing, unless, unless uh, you, are, you as a property owner or buyer are, are in the position to buy land with some secret information that there's going to be a, a new highway or a new development of some sort, land is not a very high return investment, and, and, you know, unless you've got that inside information. But if you are a large corporation, a wealthy individual, uh, you know, a, a, a Greek oligarch. It works out pretty well for McDonald's. It works out pretty well because it is so low, tr little trouble to manage. That's what, that's the appeal of, of land to, to absentees. Uh, there's not a high return, but it is a safe return, especially if you got prime land and it's very little trouble to manage. And this is, you know, a big corporation has a management bottleneck. The same does a rich person. There's just, a, you know, so many hours in the day and time you can spend, so. That's fascinating. I wanna, I wanna move out a little bit from the town to the countryside okay. and talk about agriculture. Um, I've been reading some interesting numbers that suggest that uh, the world's, the current amount of arable land in the world if everyone tried to eat the way the average person eats in the United States, the current amount of arable land in the world would feed about half the world's people today. Whereas if everyone ate a vegetarian diet, the current amount of arable land would feed some 10 billion plus people. So I'm wondering what thoughts you have on how we move toward a more equitable, sustainable form of agriculture. Well, a, a key point that I make in the article you mentioned about uh, sustainability squared is that in agriculture, as in other enterprises, the amount that you get per acre varies enormously uh, depending on, on how you go about using the land. Uh, I cited some figures uh, that showed that in Taiwan, uh, the farmers get about 10 or more times the output per acre of U.S. farms using about 10 times as much labor. So, and even in dense European countries like Holland, again, you get several times U.S. output per acre using somewhat more labor per acre and, and also using more, more chemicals and things like that. But on the other hand, in terms of fertilizer per unit of output, uh, that's way down because they're getting so much more output per acre. So and you're saying that the labor intensive farming is also better in terms of fertilizers? Yeah. And, oh yeah, and yeah. E e but, but even Taiwanese style farming, while it uses a lot of fertilizer, uh, nonetheless they get far more product per unit of fertilizer because they're doing multiple crops and they are, you know, they are out there doing intensive planting and intensive monitoring. Now, uh, I have been to Cuba, in fact, I've been to Cuba twice now, and I visited one of the uh, organic farms, which was actually in, in Havana, and this was absolutely amazing. This was a, was a small cooperative farm, part of a set of cooperatives, and they were raising a lot of animals. They had cattle, cows producing milk. Uh, they had rabbits for meat. They were raising chickens and eggs for sale. This is, you know, they were selling these into Havana. Uh, they were growing root crops. And we walked around this beautiful orchard where they also let the chickens free range in the orchard. Uh, and they had a you know water tower pumping the water and this turf I mean everything had been mulched and mulched and mulched you know you were just sort of walking on this very springy turf in the orchard and of course the chickens ran around in the orchard and this is one of their organic farms and this particular farm very impressive the the manager had only been doing this for five years and he had built this up from absolutely nothing 
and you know, and now it was sort of it was sort of a show place. But the government is trying to lease land uh, to farmers like this guy Guillermo uh, to build up further its organic agriculture. But the problem they have is is getting supplies. Nonetheless, the, the, my point is no chemicals. This is no chemical agriculture, and. They, yeah, they're using machetes and, and uh, they are using oxen to plow the land. It is, you know, absolutely chemical free and almost machinery free. And it is, again, beautifully done, some of the most productive agriculture around. So it is possible. So the question that this, yeah. this brings up to me, this uh, fascinating uh, farm situation in Cuba is, I imagine coming as they were off of a sort of a desperate economic situation, the wages weren't very high. There were a lot of workers who were willing to pitch in and they created this very viable model. How replicable is that in a high wage setting? And what, what do we do about the tendency for workers to, want, to not want to work on farms at the wages of farm workers? I was reading an article in the New York Times today, for example, about um, farming in Mexico right now that is um, highly productive, growing a lot of vegetables for the U.S. market, and over-drilling the uh, aquifers and taking the water, the wells, the village wells are going dry while the large farms are taking up all the water. Um, so how, what, how can we create incentives for some of this, these very uh, sustainable, viable organic farming methods from the economic realities that we have now? Well, the first thing we have to do is to stop subsidizing the, the kinds of non-viable technologies. And in the United States, there are all sorts of subsidies to the, the kind of very land and resource intensive agriculture that, that is the dominant form in the United States. Uh, I mentioned in my article that the tomato harvester, which some of, some people may have seen pictures of, I can I can get you some pictures, which is this great machine that sort of lumbers along o over rows of tomatoes and digs them up and shakes the tomatoes off on, onto a conveyor belt and into a bin. This is where processing tomatoes. But this was built uh, at the University of Davis under federal subsidies. And there's been there have been enormous subsidies to the mechanization of agriculture. And then if you look again at at the tax system, again the tax system encourages capital intensive uh, operations of, of all sorts. The oil industry itself receives enormous subsidies, uh, tax wise, quite apart from the implicit subsidy which is that uh, that carbon is allowed to be dumped for free into the atmosphere. Well, if you say the atmosphere belongs to all of us, uh, then at the very least, uh, oil producers or, or general carbon producers or methane producers for that matter, uh, should pay a, a tax back to the public for the privilege of using that public resource, namely the air, the atmosphere. Uh, another, and, and you bring it up in mentioning Mexico, again, the water, the groundwater should belong to all of us. It does, and Mason has written about agriculture in California. Uh, again, the California Constitution says that the water belongs to everybody. However, uh, Nonetheless, growers can pump freely, and of course, they are pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping, and the groundwater goes down, down, down. Uh, and then, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. And so then the state uh, so, you know, subsidizes bringing water in to refill the groundwater basins at public expense. And then the, one of the greatest boondoggles in history, which can, is visible from the moon, is the California State Water Project, which brings water from the Feather River in the north all the way south along the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, over the Tehachapi Mountains, into Los Angeles, and from there all the way down into San Diego. Now, this project was sold to the public on the grounds that 
uh, Southern California would uh, dry up and blow away without more water. Uh, that, this was a fairly substantial uh, lie, shall we say, uh, because there actually was already a lot of water in Southern California. It was just being wasted because it was being delivered in unlined canals, and again, there were no restrictions on groundwater pumping. So this enormous state water project was built to bring water to you know thirsty Los Angeles. Well, guess what? Los Angeles didn't really need the water. So funny thing, along the way, uh, on the west side of the Central Valley were these giant landholders, including the Chandler family that owned the LA Times, and they hadn't been able to develop their land because there wasn't that much water. Well, gosh, all of this water is here. We don't need it yet for Los Angeles. And furthermore, the, the water that was in earlier water projects was subject to the 160-acre limitation, or, which meant that any individual could not get subsidized water for more than uh, 160 acres. Well, on the, on the west side, under the, where it was California water instead of federal water, uh, no 160-acre limitations, so the Tahone Ranch and Chandler's and uh, uh, Occidental Petroleum and some of the other big landowners got this super, super cheap water <laughs> with which they are now growing almonds. And I've been in Israel where they don't have a whole lot of water and they have a very careful drip irrigation, you know, tiny little tubes that dribble just the right amount at the root of the plant and to the next one. So again, it is possible to have very productive agriculture using vastly less water. And again, if you look at the, the agriculture of Japan or, or, or these high density countries, the very fact that you are keeping a plot in operation year round you're saving water or, or, or you're saving the amount of water per crop just by keeping these plots in operation and tending them carefully. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you were which doing... Which demands more labor. Which demands more labor. Oh, yeah. I mean, drip irrigation, does that ever demand labor? Because you have to go around and you've got to check the little valve at each plant and you've got to move your hoses around. Mm -hmm. So drip irrigation, again, is much more labor intensive. But that's my, that's my point. The point is you can have agriculture that is vastly more productive per acre by using a lot more labor. And if you stopped and you, know, you said, oh, well, labor people won't work for such low wages. Well, if you stopped subsidizing doing it in a very land and capital intensive way, the wages would go up because the work needs to be done if you're not subsidizing doing it in a land and capital intensive way. The, uh, you're going to need more labor, and if you need more labor, guess what? The wages go up. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, as I, as in, in my goal of uh, fielding a basic course on these matters, I, I am always looking for generalizable principles. What I keep hearing you say, I think, is that if the resources, if we think of the resources as belonging to the entire community, we will create the right incentives. Would that be a fair statement to, to make? Yeah, that would be a fair statement. If, the, if ultimately the land and the air and the water belong to all of us, and we charge the users a fair price for using them, and that's a land tax, or in California, making people pay to use the water. Or a pollution tax. Or a pollution tax, making polluters pay to use the air. And by that, I mean the, the coal and, and oil industry, not the final users, uh, because that's the efficient way to do it. Uh, yes, then, then we can drastically cut down on the destruction of resources and have and have uh, better jobs, higher wages. It, you know, it's win-win situation. I like it. <laughs> Let's do it. In our last segment, we look at social philosophy. How does the remedy square with the law of human progress? <laughs>